while there's a bit of dispute that sort of the, the public good was lost in a private tunnel, if you will, in terms of the provision of tubes and, and other um, forms of transport, actually the eventual solution that was hit upon in the form of the London Passenger Transport Board actually has quite a good record of safeguarding both private and public interests as well, and in spite of what's said, um, or at least um, in quite heavily implied in the literature as it currently stands. So there you go, that's the gist of the argument that I'm going to present to you um, over the next sort of 20, 25 minutes as we go forward. So we're going to start with this man, who most of you in the room, no doubt, will recognise as Lord Ashfield. Um, in case you don't um, uh, know who he was, well, essentially his role in London's transport began in 1907 when he was brought in by Sir George Gibb, basically to shake out um, uh, the more or less bankrupt tube system at that particular moment. And he continued in one capacity or another, but generally in very senior capacities, as the chairman of the Underground Electric Railways of London Company, and then later as the chairman of the RPTB, right the way through to 1948. So his entire career was 41 years, uh, and he died in harness, actually. He died at work still. Um, uh, as chairman of the LPTB. And in a sense, his views, um, and as far as they have been recorded, and there is a very extensive private business correspondence available in the TfL archives, have more or less become the gold standard, if you will, by which people like Parker and Robbins and so on have used to support their arguments concerning um, um, London transport. And then probably the most critical quote of all is the one that I have singled out there, because you see this reoccurring again and again and again and again, all the way through the literature. Um, uh, on the London Underground, and we've just got it there. And here he is, and he says, in my experience, the tube railways have never paid a reasonable return on the capital invested in them. And he made that in a speech in 1924. And I think it's been widely misconstrued, um, and he's been doubly damned um, in a rather contradictory way, actually. And I'm going to explore a bit of this as we go forward. So the first thing that's kind of hung around his head um, 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 as a result of this statement is that this is the proof, if you will, the proof that private never works. Because there you have it. You have it from the man himself, uh, the chairman of these various organisations, that tube railways, yeah, they never, they, they never give a reasonable return. Well, my first sort of argument about that is that is simply not true. If you dig into the, um, the accounts of the various tube railways, it is not true that they never paid a reasonable return to their shareholders. You find that in the various classifications of shares allocated to different shareholders at different times, you do get tube railways paying 4, 5 and 6% on an annual basis, it's the case. It is also true, of course, that some tube railways paid nothing at all, and we do have to accept that. But that statement has been used as a sort of gigantic roller brush to say that all tube railways, all private tube railways, never paid a reasonable return. And that, quite simply, I think is open to challenge right from the outset. Um, but there is another interpretation of what he said, um, and it's this. You can look at it as a general statement about returns on investment overall. And if you accept, well, if, if you accept that from the outset the, the LPT beyond its creation took over about £120 million of working capital when it was set up in 1933, and they could only really afford to pay a four to five and a half percent return on it to the, bond, to the bondholders there. And then you compare that with a company like the Associated Equipment Company, one million pounds of invested capital, returns as high as 44 percent on some of the bus companies. Then you can look at what he says, and perhaps what he means here is not that the shareholders were badly remunerated, but merely that if you sunk 120 million pounds into something, you might hope for something slightly better than a sort of four to six percent ban for your returns. And if someone can achieve that with only one million pounds of startup capital or invested capital, then perhaps they don't. You know, the cheap railways do suffer by comparison. So there are different ways of looking at that comment. Now, I'm sure the authors of those books were all aware of those interpretations, um, but I would argue they've chosen to gloss over them, and they've just used that as a kind of a blanket comment about the viability of tube railways in general, without making any of those <coughs> distinctions. Um, there is a final comment, um, that we might, or final set bit of information, I think, that's useful um, uh, in interpreting what we have up there. And that is that the year in which and the circumstances in which it was set. So we know that it was given in a speech to shareholders in 1924. In 1924, the URL and Lord Ashfield were essentially engaged in a battle against what were known as the private, or the pu private buses, pirate buses, as they were known. I'll talk more about that in due course. And he was also trying to prove to the government that what he needed to make London transport work were a series of cheap government loans. Now, he'd already taken a certain amount of capital from the government already through the Trade Facilities Act in 1921-22, but he knew, or he wanted more, 
essentially. Now, what he could not afford to happen in 1924 was the idea or the idea to sort of bleed into public perception that somehow the UERL or the London Transport Combine, as it was known, was this sort of gigantic monopoly that was making big profits on the back of exploiting its monopoly position. So he had to come out, I would suggest to you, and fairly frequently say in public and in various meetings like this one, that they made no money whatsoever, they never had done, and they'd never paid any reasonable money, and the whole idea was nonsense. Because if he'd admitted to the case that actually at this point in time he was returning dividends of sort of 5 6%, there's no chance he could have got his hands on the money, I would suggest, from central government. And his whole case against the small-scale private operators who were in fact undercutting his business at this time would have fallen down. So his comments definitely need to be taken in context. Um, and there's a very clear context to those comments there. And again, my criticism perhaps of the literature that exists is that again, they use this as a kind of all-encompassing flat statement and there is nothing said about what was going on in the London transport scene at this particular moment. So earlier on I said I was going to talk a little bit about efficiency versus effectiveness. And I'm going to flesh that out now a little bit more, um, having sort of set the scene there with, uh, with Lord Ashfield um, uh, and his comments. Uh, about whether or not transport paid. And in this context, I'm going to say that efficiency is a term that really relates to things like return on investment, um, how much money, I suppose, you're getting back on your investment in a particular public service. Whereas effectiveness really has more connotations that concern are you actually delivering the things that the general public wants to have? Never mind perhaps whether or not it offers a great. Um, uh, return on um, uh, the money invested in it. And my argument here is that in the period 1985 to 1933, while London Transport was provided by a variety of uh, private um, um, companies, also it has to be said for municipal providers as well, they were highly effective uh, at doing a number of things. And you see a short list that I've composed just there. <coughs> First of all, I'm going to argue that there really was a genuine consumer choice in this period, in a way that there wasn't subsequently. Once the LPTB had set up, it didn't matter whether you caught a tram or a bus um, uh, or a, an underground train, they all ultimately originated back um, to the same company. You could, of course, take a train, um, and then, of course, I suppose, in a sense, particularly the southern region, to a lesser extent, the LN, the R, and the LMS, were in a limited sense com competing on certain routes um, uh, with the LPTB. But in reality, the LPTB was granted a semi-monopoly within its operating area. But up until that point, there was genuine consumer choice over different routes that you could take at different times. As a result of that, I'm going to argue that there was a strong record in innovation, and bear in mind this is the period at which steam was phased out and electricity was brought in. There was also a wide variety in experiments, and we can look back on them perhaps with the benefit of hindsight and say that they were rather wasteful, they didn't lead anywhere, about what sort of tube system you really wanted to have. I mean, we know things that are as basic as, if you will, the, um, the size of the tunnels. There were at least three different attempts to have a look at different sizes. City and South London Railway differed from the central, the central differed from the Great Northern City. Now, all of that, I think, to us nowadays looks somewhat wasteful. Why not, you know, if the, if the gauge was going to be 11 foot or the size of the tunnel was going to be 11 foot 6 inches, why not just start? start off from the outset and build a standard tunnel um, to that size. But the reality is there's a lot of different, uh, there's sort of the startup at the beginning of different companies. You have to explore different avenues. It's not always clear what the answer is going to be right from the outset. And you see of that. So there's a lot of innovation. You've also got the, um, the advent of the diesel bus um, uh, for the first time. And you have a variety of other innovations that take place in this period in terms of the improvements in rolling stock, speeds, um, uh, the introduction of pneumatic doors and so on and so forth. So it's a period of, of dynamism in many respects, and it's dynamic because there is competition, I'm going to argue to you, um, which dies away gradually as they, these begin to be eliminated. It's also a period of falling fares. Fares never get as cheap again as they are during the First World War, and they are, you could almost argue, scandalously cheap in that period. They are ridiculously cheap. In a sense, they are comparable for that brief period of time um, to power fares, say, on the Paris Metro, or on the Berlin Metro, or the Berlin U-Bahn, uh, or possibly even in New York. And the idea there is you move away from a system that perhaps tries to justify its costs, or pay its costs, or pay its way and return a profit, and you simply say that transport, in a sense, is a socialised service that should be available to everyone for a peppercorn fare. So, very briefly, you get that idea coming forward, and it's partly, again, driven uh, by this idea of competition and trams competing with the tubes, tubes competing with the buses and so on and so forth, and you do get falling fares. Um, you get an expanding network, and I'm not just talking about the tube network, which admittedly does not expand um, uh, for about 10 years after 1910, it then begins to expand again in the 1920s, but you get an expanding tram network, you get an expanding, particularly expanding bus network, 
in this particular period. So there's more available at a lesser cost, more or less consistently throughout all of this. Uh, and again, I can't help thinking that that's probably good from the perspective of the consumer. The last thing is probably the most tenuous point in my view. Does this truly represent a shareholder democracy? And if you go and look at the, uh, the shareholder's book, if you will, um, uh, from the Central London Rail, which is available at the London Metropolitan Archive, you can find that very genuinely the people who sank their savings into this really do come from all walks of society. Um, you get ironmongers, you get costmongers, you get butchers, you get priests, you get widows, and so on. You do, of course, also get Lord Rothschild, uh, and possibly his holding might have outweighed quite a lot of other people's. But it's interesting. As the organisations begin to develop and as you move towards the LPTB and its successors, essentially the institutions move in and the private individuals move out. But in the early days, particularly of the, the early tubes and so on, you could argue that the people who owned them were quite a genuine cross-section of society. Now, whether that's good or bad, um, I couldn't honestly tell you. All I can say is that their interests were perhaps more expansive, or the people who were controlling them had an, uh, an interest in the, the outcome of their financial operation were a much more diverse set of people in this particular period um, than the American banks, Dutch banks and French banks even who began to move in uh, and buy them out as the century progressed. So there you are. Um, I leave that there as a, a question mark about whether they represented a shareholder democracy but they certainly had a lot of quite ordinary people who thought they were worth a punt. Now all of this came under a challenge essentially really um, almost from the outset in the early part of the 20th century. People who said look um, this is not a very efficient way of constructing the tube or governing it for that matter. Um, and everything that I've just talked about in terms of innovation, um, uh, in terms of falling costs and so on, is actually extremely wasteful. Because um, if you put each other out of business, then that ultimately is not a particularly effective way of delivering the services that um, a, a capital city might want. So the idea of competition gradually becomes, moves away from the idea of, um, of innovation, of dynamism, and moves towards the idea of being inefficient and wasteful. Um, but let's look essentially at, at what happened over this period because I think this is quite illuminating. Um, and I'm going to look at sort of six different events one after another. The first thing is the municipal tube. Um, so there were two opportunities to set up a municipal tube. One was in 1907 um, when the private companies essentially had run into a minor financial crisis. And um, Sir Edgar Speyer, um, who was a financier, approached the LCC in that year and said, well, look, do you want to take an interest, um, a financial interest in owning the tube? The interesting thing is, is that he was turned down by the LCC. That would have been a moment which municipal socialists, the people who believed in planning, um, and for all sorts of good reasons, should have stepped forward and said, yes, yes, this is the moment at which we are going to buy London's transport system for the city, and we're going to operate it um, uh, in our way. However, they turned it down, um, but they had another opportunity um, in 1920, and in that year, um, one of the councillors, Mr. Emil Davis, proposed that £5 million should be raised to build a municipal tube here in London. Now, one of the, the myths that I run across quite often in the reading is somehow London, it's uh, doesn't have, never had the powers in the same way that New York had to raise finance to build these municipal projects. That is not true. London did have the powers to raise municipal finance to do municipal projects of this type. The interesting thing is that Mr. Randall Davis's proposal was voted down 37 to 61 by the LCC in that year. So I come back to this idea. The LCC was not blocked from doing these things. Yes, Parliament was suspicious of these kind of projects, I can understand that. It was suspicious of handing over powers, um, but actually the opportunities existed. They were turned down. Um, as to why, um, I need to study the minutes in some more detail, but the net result is that the municipal bodies that could have centrally planned on a more rational basis chose not to in the end, um, uh, and that's something that I have to say is not talked about in the existing literature at all. Um, so the only, we come to the issue of municipal water transport, and perhaps I think this maybe shines a little bit of light on the suspicion um, uh, of municipal projects, because as we know, in, the, in, the, in 1905, the LCC did take over um, the control and the provision of London water transport, which had become totally moribund uh, by that period, probably on account of the Princess Alice disaster, um, also because of increasing competition from the trams and the tubes themselves. But the LCC stepped up and they said, yes, we are going to run, we're going to put on a municipal water boat service. Um, regrettably, um, uh, for fans of municipalisation, it lost money in every single year, uh, and it was shut down about four years later. I think that's a, it's not a lost opportunity, um, but I can imagine that that incident was hung about the neck of anyone 
who then spoke up about the possibility of municipalising other forms of transport from then on. So that is a pity, um, but the fact is it happened. Um, it remains the case that the issue over a municipal water transport, and there's a great deal more detail about it than just what I've very briefly glossed over, is almost totally ignored in all the existing literature. So that episode just doesn't feature um, uh, in any of the books um, that discuss the, uh, the evolution of, of London transport in this period. Um, the municipal buses, um, I'm afraid they weren't the same way as the municipal tube. Um, it was voted down. Um, reasons, I don't know, possibly related to the municipal transport, water transport fiasco, but there it is. But again, the opportunity was there, it was rejected. Now, trams, of course, are the exception, um, because we know that the LCC did operate um, a very successful, I would argue, um, uh, tram operation over this period. Um, one little piece of interesting um, evidence I've dug up about this is that they were always held, quote unquote, not to be profitable. Now, I think there are immense difficulties with the notion of profitability in uh, a socialised, um, uh, I suppose, or the socialised provision of public services. But what I did discover is that between 1898 and 1905, the, uh, the tram service actually handed over over £300,000, which is a much larger sum of money then, obviously, than it might seem to us now, in what was called ratepayers relief. So, in fact, the, um, the trams were basically being bled to keep rates down um, over that period. Um, and I think people who then said, well, you're not making any profit, um, neglected a, a sort of variety of funds, including that one, um, um, uh, which um, money was effectively being siphoned off into. So I think um, the evidence here was highly, highly politicised. Um, uh, I think that's probably the thing we can take away from that little piece of evidence um, a, a, as we, when we look at this issue. Again, no mention of that um, in any of the books um, or, or um, uh, uh, literature on the topic. So those, if you will, are kind of the practical examples of what was going on at the time. Um, I'm now going to move to some sort of the legislation um, uh, that was um, happening in the period. The first thing is this thing, the Kennedy Jones Report. Um, this was a sort of pretty high level um, um, piece of, um, not legislation, but a report that strongly suggested the setting up of a London traffic authority in 1920, basically modelled on the, um, the Metropolitan Transit Authority uh, over in New York. It was rejected, um, uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly, but again, another opportunity to do this um, turned down. Um, in 1921, um, the Oldswater Commission was set up, and its job essentially was to reform London government. Now, none of this necessarily had any direct impact, shall we say, on the land and transport scene, because transport was just one of the many public authorities that the, or public duties, I should say, that um, um, Oldswater was sort of set up to have a look at. Um, but in a rather sort of humiliating result, um, the London boroughs and, and the LCC were just completely unable to make any kind of coherent case for a more, shall we say, rationalised, uh, perhaps a more socialist approach to the governance of London. And in fact, the committee considering it split not two ways, but three ways in the end. Uh, one minority report said that actually we should just keep the existing system and set up one or two more ad hoc bodies to provide water, gas, uh, transport, and one or two other things. Another minority said, no, what you actually need is a much larger LCC um, uh, to take in a far larger ge geographical area, and they should be charged with the provision of things uh, like transport, um, like lighting, like sewerage, and so on and so forth. And then finally, another minority said, well, actually, what you need is bring in more councils like Hertfordshire, Essex, and so on into the Greater London area, and we should run those as a, a sort of much larger and extended Greater London Council. Now, the result was that because they presented this uh, <laughs> for the Parliament, and there was the three minority reports, it was just thrown out straight away. And in fact, Robson, um, uh, who writes about this quite extensively in his book, The Government and Misgovernment of London, says that in reality, it was such a fiasco that in his view, and he was present at the time, he almost accuses these people of sabotage in reality. It was so incompetent and so badly presented uh, that it was effectively just laughed out. Uh, and you have to look back and say, well, this in reality was a huge missed opportunity in many ways to rationalise the provision of public services in general, but obviously including transport in London. And again, it was missed, essentially. The last thing is the Poplar Rates Rebellion, um, which sort of sputtered on and off in the sort of 1922, 23, 24, 25. Um, the net result of the Poplar Rates Rebellion was that... Um, central government decided to award itself the powers to sack any councillor um, who had been surcharged more than £500 um, for the provision of public services over and above that which the borough had actually voted for. So um, I suppose just to explain that, what you had was a situation where a variety of, of local councils, including Poplar and a number in South Wales, decided just to deliberately break their budgets um, and see what would happen. 
Um, and by 1927, the central government got fed up with that, uh, and they passed the Local Authorities Audit Act, which allowed them just to remove councillors out of it. And that represented, in many ways, that kind of fatal, well, not fatal, but that kind of curtailing of local government powers that's so often alluded to in the literature. But note, it wasn't done until 1927. Um, this was a long time into this particular period, and up until that time, um, local authorities actually had surprising powers um, uh, to invest in, uh, in, local, um, uh, in local schemes. So it comes quite late um, uh, in this particular history, but that's the, the cut-off point, if you will, at which point local authorities are capped, more or less, in what they can achieve. So I think what to take away from all of that? Well, in my opinion, at any rate, what I'm arguing to you is this. Um, if we look at the specifics, um, we have a number of opportunities there, very specifically relating to transport, all of which are stymied in different ways, um, uh, one way or another. And the legislative background to that shows a sort of similar pattern, if you will, of, uh, I'm going to be frank, incompetence uh, and legislative bungling. So it's not surprising, perhaps, um, uh, that um, uh, the socialisation, the rationalisation of transport in London didn't happen, but then the blame, I don't, I don't think the blame can be uh, sort of solely attributed to um, unscrupulous private operators or a, a conservative with a small c um, uh, House of Commons. So what eventually did um, uh, trigger um, the, uh, the arrival of the London Passenger Transport Board? And I'm going to argue to you it was really one particular episode in 1923-24 uh, known as the Pirate Bus Mania. And so having rejected um, socialisation, having rejected centralisation, rationalisation, um, there was then a sort of brief episode when the, the, the free market was allowed its last hurrah. Um, and um, this, I think, largely arose from the, as a result of the large number of men who'd been trained as drivers um, in the First World War. The service, the Army Service Corps, expanded from six and a half to about 350,000 men. They were all demobilised, uh, and at the same time, a huge number of ex-army trucks spilled onto the uh, spilled onto the market. And it was very, very easy to set up a one. Well, I suppose a three-man bus company uh, with one bus uh, and start effectively to go busking more or less on the streets of London, looking for um, looking for trade. Um, and between 1922 and 1924, the number of buses on London streets jumped from 3,100 to about 4,500, 50%, quite a remarkable increase. And there began to be a sort of variety of incidents that are quite well catalogued uh, concerning you know, buses changing direction when they saw the more profitable um, uh, sort of larger queue of people hoping to view in one direction. A number of rather unpleasant incidents, um, some involving physical violence, people were moved from buses and so on and so forth. And the public began to quite seriously complain. However, the thing that really um, spurred the government into action um, was that wages began to be undercut between bus drivers uh, and conductors and so on. And in the end, it was the threat of an incipient bus strike in early 1924 that spurred the Labour government of that period into essentially um, building up the number of what were called restricted streets within London, i.e. a street along which the government or the public authority would no longer accept any more buses as being licensed to operate. When they passed the legislation, they promised that, um, quote, only a few streets would be available. However, quite quickly, pretty much everything within in what we now call Zone 1 was nominated a restricted street and bang um, uh, went the, uh, the small private operators. By 1927, the same year as the, um, uh, the, the local government audit act, you only had 150 buses left um, that were not run by the combine in one way. So the little experiment in the private sector was done. Um, that, I think, probably concentrated people's minds. Um, there certainly seems to be quite a lot of evidence in the archive about questions in Parliament, and you go into Hansard and have a look at it, and people found the London bus media an unacceptable solution, if you will, to, um, uh, to public transport within, uh, within London. Certainly, think back to Lord Ashfield back in 1924. Um, this would have been disastrous for him if it had been allowed to get out of hand or continue any longer. His fares were being undercut, and there was an incipient strike um, coming in. They had to be stopped. So... What was put in its place? Well, eventually, this organisation, the London Passive Transport Board, which, to my mind at any rate, was unquestionably um, an early example of quasi-autonomous non-governmental organisation. There's a huge amount of quite interesting research, I think, that I'm going to have a look at, um, uh, looking at the effectiveness of Quangos as, as public um, service providers, which you can uh, compare and contrast to the 1980s to the 1930s. Um, but for our purposes here this evening, I, I think my third hypothesis was that it was an effective safeguard of both the public and the private interest. And you can see that um, most effectively in sections 3.1 and sections 3.4 right there in its, um, uh, its, its parliamentary act there. So the 3.1 tells us that we want a properly coordinated system um, and we're avoiding the provision of unnecessary and wasteful competitive services in order to improve facilities and provide an efficient public service. Now that's all good, isn't it? It's very much 
in the sort of the same narrative that the literature on this particular topic would espouse. This is how we do it. We have one organisation, a private monopoly in this particular instance, we were shame it couldn't be a public monopoly, but there it is, providing these kind of efficient public services. The catch comes in section four. And I think the key bit there is, as you see, I've highlighted it and made it bold, to secure that their revenues shall be sufficient to defray all charges. Now that is a real problem for any kind of public service provider, because I don't think that you can reconcile section 3.1 with section 3.4. However, never mind that, that is a topic perhaps for another lecture at another time. For our purposes, um, what I think you can see there is the intent very much is to safeguard both the public interest, as expressed in 3.1, and also the private interest, as expressed in 3-4, because of that is telling all the shareholders and the bondholders and the owners of private capital not to sweat because actually their interests will be defended. Now, there's a whole wealth of information in the archives that shows that actually their interests were not defended at all and they were more or less sold out on. But the underlying intent is there. Um, interestingly, I would argue in the literature, it tends to be section 3-4 that people like Christian Bourmar pick up on in particular. And they say, actually, this organisation was run for the interests of bondholders. I think there's a massive amount of evidence to show that's not the case. But never mind that um, uh, for the time being. Um, uh, we'll leave it, I suppose, with that sort of um, dual duty there um, uh, for both, the, um, uh, the, both the, the public and the private sector. So what about my conclusions then? Well, there you are. Um, I argue that the effectiveness um, um, of private provision is overlooked. It might not have been very efficient. I concede that point. Um, I'm happy to argue it. Um, but I think it was highly effective, actually, at doing the things that people wanted to do. An expanding network, a dynamic network, a lot of innovation, and what is more, the fares fell fairly steadily. Actually, it was possibly slightly disastrous in the long term because they're putting themselves out of business. But in the meantime, there was a cheap and very dynamic system of public transport going on there. And competition was the spur to a lot of it. Um, I'm a big fan of municipalisation, don't get me wrong, I'm not against it in any way, shape or form, but I don't think it was thrown out by the evil machinations of capitalists or landowners in Parliament. I think municipalists either turned it down themselves or they presented their case so badly that their proposals couldn't really be taken seriously. That is a great shame. Um, and I'm not trying to argue against that, but the reality of it is this, there is much to blame themselves um, uh, as any sort of outside conspiracies um, uh, or anything else. And finally, I think whilst the LPTB had its flaws, I think you can see in its founding document that actually it was an attempt to secure both the private interest and the public interest as well. And you know, certainly my PhD, I will be arguing that it did a pretty, it did as good a job as it could of doing those two things. And they are quite contradictory and they set the organisation up with certain irreconcilable goals. But there it is, as a statement of intent, it does quite a good job, I think, of trying to balance both those conflicting interests in the governance of public transport in London. So I'm going to um, conclude at this point. Thank you all very much indeed. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, James. Um, really interesting presentation. Um, obviously, I do have a slight bias being the corporate <laughs> archivist for, for TfL. Um, I think it's you know, particularly interesting some of the points that, that you made there about sort of innovation and then that, that end point of the private and public interest. Be try, they're trying their best to protect, and it's certainly something that kind of I feel quite confident that. that the modern incarnation of the LPTB also kind of puts quite at, at its core. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask of James? Well, now you, you titled this talk, Who Shall Guard the Guards? <laughs> 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 which, uh, but, but, which I suppose led me to expect something in a different Absolutely. direction. But let, let's just, if we stick with the ideas of efficiency and effectiveness, mm -hmm talked about effectiveness in terms of, from the customer's point of view, what the fares were like, what their choice was like. Can you say a bit more about effectiveness in terms of the employee's point of view and yes. the effectiveness of actually managing employees? Because the only point that you talked about was the threat of the power of buses undercutting mm. fares and yes. uh, uh, undercutting wages. You're quite right. I, I have neglected employees and all this, but I can talk, I can talk about them. Okay. Sorry they weren't part of that. Um, 
The story of this period for employees is that um, conditions improve rapidly. Um, I mean, there's the, there's the railway strike just after the First World War, and you find that hours spent on the job diminish quite rapidly. I think off the top of my head, the average diminishes from 56 hours to 48 hours a week. It's quite a big drop. Um, pay in this period um, accelerates quite dramatically um, for all grades, particularly during the First World War. What then happens is a, is a sort of is a tale of two stories, really, or two classes of, um, um, of employee. The drivers um, secure an agreement that um, their gains are going to be safeguarded. So each increment paid out under, I suppose, the inflationary pressures of the First World War is going to be retained. That each step is permanent, in other words. As a result of that, actually, their steps are smaller. That's understandable. So the war sees a huge collapse in pay differentials, as is so often the case. So what happens, unfortunately, for, I suppose, the other grades, after all the porters, um, the people who run the stations and so on, is that their pay increases are indexed to the cost of living. And you get a huge collapse in inflation after. You get de very serious deflation after World War I. And so you find pay differentials open right out again. However, what's won, I suppose, especially by the drivers and the salary grades during World War One, is retained, and they keep that. And actually, as you go forward and you hit the 30s and so on, you find that, on, in general, employees of London Transport, the UERL, and later the LPTB, are significantly better paid um, than their counterparts in other industries. Um, that's retained interesting until the Second World War, and then, curiously, the Second World War completely erodes um, all of that, and they, London Transport begins to have a recruitment crisis more or less from 1948 onwards. But in the period we're talking about, from the perspective of, um, uh, 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 from, um, I suppose, employees under the system, they don't do too badly at all. There is that issue with the buses. I, I accept there's a moment in 1923-24 when, when people's pay get, begins to get undercut, but that's stopped very quickly. The threat of strikes uh, and the actuality, of, or the, the actuality of some strikes is very, very effective at securing um, uh, either pay, re retaining their pay um, after World War II or even bolstering it. So.